Good afternoon. We have um, our usual, um, in fact, maybe even more packed than ever, uh, this meeting of the All Party Group. And again, apologies for the size of our venue, um, which is always totally inadequate for the uh, meeting itself. Um, but you've obviously come back with renewed enthusiasm in the new year. Um, and we have a, probably a greater number of people than, uh, than normal, even. Um, we have a uh, terrific panel um, today. We're talking about um, data governance, collection and use, um, which uh, uh, was not really, uh, for the purposes of AI, really um, settled by the GDPR, although probably most people in this room, in a way, have been wrestling with that apart from anything else and have been learned uh, treatises on whether or not uh, the GDPR insists on explainability um, of algorithms and so on. There's lots of um, very uh, uh, splendid papers out there which are uh, totally inconclusive on the subject. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there is a lot of issues um, surrounding uh, data, not least uh, some of them uh, that we covered in our House of Lords report last year, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, the kind of spectrum of uh, uh, different uses uh, uh, to which data could be used uh, uh, in uh, the public domain in terms of you know, NHS data versus um, data uh, that you use for transport purposes. So the, the big differences in quality and how uh, one needs to uh, approach the different uh, aspects such as privacy um, in relation to that data. Um, so I think there are a, a lot of different issues which we didn't manage to resolve. We sort of pointed out some of the issues uh, involved, um, but we did, didn't really come up with a, a kind of template which allowed us to uh, uh, decide uh, uh, exactly you know, where um, uh, the whole question of monetization of data um, should come. And of course, that is one of the, the big issues as well. We had, uh, if you like, the deep mind situation um, with the Royal Free, uh, uh, um, which was uh, quite controversial at the time. Um, but of course, um, you know, that's just uh, one part of the forest. There are many other um, areas that uh, one could uh, look at in the whole area of, of uh, data as well. And of course, I don't need to tell the audience here uh, that data is utterly crucial uh, when we're talking about machine learning, uh, AI, uh, uh, because that is the um, the basis on which that particular form of AI um, is constructed and trained and so on. So uh, we're, we're really right at the heart of uh, one of the issues um, uh, involving the ethics and the application of artificial intelligence. So um, I'm not going to go on, so it's here uh, 10 minutes, but I think that's a, grossly over, a gross <coughs> overestimate of uh, uh, how long the introduction should be. Um, so I'm going to move very swiftly on, and I'm absolutely delighted um, to see uh, Dame Wendy Hall here, uh, who's the Regis Professor of Computer Science, University of Southampton, amongst many other things, the author of the Hall Pacenti Review, uh, the Government Advisor on Skills on AI, uh, and very plugged into the Government Office uh, on, on AI and the AI Council. Um, and so really, um, she is an entirely appropriate person to open the batting um, on this, uh, uh, this very tricky topic. Uh, Tim, Wendy. thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, we only have five minutes and I could talk for five hours or more on this. So you've done the introduction for me. I don't have to say who I am. I could um, just talk about the AI review and how wonderful the things that are happening. This week we got the 1,000 PhDs over the line from Treasury. So... Um, we're, we're motoring on. But actually I want to talk about something different. I want to talk about what's happening to the internet and then at the end tell you why that's so important. The internet is fragmenting. It's already fragmented in long language lines. But a colleague of mine, um, Dr Kieran O'Hara and myself, wrote a paper just before Christmas as we were going to a, a conference in San Francisco about the future of the internet um, called Four Internets, the Geopolitics of Digital Governance. It's published on a, a site in Canada, and we got an FT uh, op-ed, and uh, we got the lead editorial in the FT's end-of-year editorial, which is fabulous, because uh, they said this is really important. I think it is for these reasons. Um, 
the, as I said, it's already split by language and all sorts of things. And we started off with an open and free internet. And I don't have to tell most of the people in the room that this is all about making life better for everybody. But because it was open and free, the bad guys used it as well as the good guys. And we have some, now living with the consequences of what an open and free internet meant. And I have brought with me, there's experts in the room over there who know all about this, how we designed the web and how Tim did it and what he's trying to do to fix it. But if you look at what's happening on a geopolitical level, um, we sort of split the world in our paper into three regions, possibly three plus one. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I want to call it four internets and a funeral, but I can't. <laughs> so the open and free is the one. The, first, the second one is uh, what's happening in the US. The US is largely market driven. And uh, in terms of data governance, it's very, I mean, the, most of the Silicon Valley companies are based, well, so of course, the Silicon Valley companies are based there, but the big companies are based there, apart from the ones in China. And uh, they lobby the government to get the laws they want that work for them. It's a market force driven um, world. And uh, whilst they say that, a lot of them say, yeah, we, we like GDPR, um, I, I, would, this t I was trying to do some shopping online <coughs> and I went to a US website and it said, sorry, we can't sell it to you because you live in Europe and we aren't GDPR compliant. So it's already broken. Um, Europe has gone very data protection. Uh, UK signed up to that. I see no signs of that changing. It's a very good thing. It's a good principle, what we're trying to do. There's a lot of argument that maybe it will stifle innovation if we aren't careful about how it's implemented. But we are definitely leading the world in that. It's a choice we've taken. Will the rest of the world follow? The elephant in the room, of course, is China. Um, China, which is uh, uh, still at the moment the biggest uh, country in, uh, in population terms and in, in geographical terms as well, has gone for complete surveillance. Okay? They will argue, and I could talk more about this in questions, that they are protecting their citizens in doing this. The censorship, the um, trying to control fake news, lies, um, trying to control what the social media does in China, they will argue is protecting their citizens. The price they pay for that, of course, is freedom of speech um, and all the things we know that we hold so dearly. Um, we, there's so many stories coming out about this at the moment. Um, and when we see the, you know, what's, uh, the, what's Facebook, what's happening through Facebook and what doesn't happen in China like that, it's interesting. But China's got this one social media, really, it's all down to WeChat. If you live in China, you have to use WeChat. You have to bank through WeChat. Um, you have to do everything through WeChat. And you know that all your data can be accessed by the government for whatever they want to do with it. I could say more, but I haven't got time. Uh, the, the plus one is Russia. Um, we know that they, they spy on us, they hack, they snoop. Um, we don't know what their aims are really other than to stir things in terms of what they've done doing with in terms of uh, our democratic elections and so on. So they're a bit of a, in our paper, we, we call them um, the agitators. Um, I just want to finish with two remarks. Firstly, we have just reached the 50-50 moment. The 50-50 moment is that, uh, it's disputed how you count it, but either just before, like, just at the end of last year or just at the beginning of this year, 50% of the world were on the internet, had access to the internet. That's awesome in two ways. Firstly, in 30 years since Tim put the first website up, 50% of the world has access to that web. You might have to pay when you get to a point, but it's 50% have access one way or another onto that. The other way it's awesome is there's still 50% to come. And where do those 50% live? They're mostly in rural China, rural India, and rural Africa. India's a very interesting case, will become the largest country soon. Democracy, but how they're going to go in this world is really important. They do have their unique ID, the government, the laws go backwards and forwards on how much the government can access information. They have forced to use that ID to open bank accounts. Could go either way. China owns Africa. China has put the internet into Africa. If you do the sums, uh, when the rest of the 50% of the world gets on the internet, it could be managed in a way that China manages the internet. And we really need to think about that. The second, my final point is, when we talk about AI, it's all, today's AI, we're talking about machine learning here, which is really what we're talking about with AI at the moment. It's all about who has access to the data. And so... My lords, I rest my case. Yeah. <laughs>
Great, Wendy, thank you very much. I mean, you wrote that, that uh, a very good paper on the geopolitics of, of digital governance. I mean, um, uh, and you've sort of given us quite a bad <coughs> view about the, the future. I mean, how optimistic are you that you know, some of that, uh, if you like, global governance could actually be implemented? Or do you think it's going to be rather balkanised in terms of different regions? I think we have to be upfront and talk to the Chinese. And when, how can I say this without giving away anything I'm not supposed to say, when I talk to the Office for AI... You're, it, you're amongst friends here. <laughs> yeah, it's all going to be public. Um, there is definitely a way in which I think we, and that we could be the UK, the EU, and or with our partners like Canada and France, could be an honest broker in this situation, where you've got the superpowers of the US and China that are look like they want to battle it out in this cyberspace as well as every other space. We could be an honest broker that says, you know, access to data, and I, not ownership, because I don't think this idea that we can own our data doesn't make any sense, because <coughs> most of our data... When you, it's not ours, it's shared with somebody else or lots of other people. So it's not ownership, it's who has access to data that, is, it, that we are involved with. Um, and, and, and starting from that basis and talking on that basis, I think, I think, and we have to talk, we cannot just ignore China. That's what I would say to the UK government. We cannot ignore China. It's too dangerous to... You've got to engage. We have to engage. It's my Great. And I, yeah, that's right. Thank you very much indeed. And I suspect that Jenny is almost as well travelled as you are, um, <laughs> since I met Jenny at the uh, uh, Canada, Canada Colloquium, um, and she was nodding vigorously. Uh, and Jenny, uh, by the way, Jenny Tennyson is the CEO of the Open Data Institute, and she was nodding vigorously when you said uh, not ownership but access. And um, I think that's a very interesting saviour. Jenny. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and uh, keep my comments to the, to the questions that, that we were posed. Um, just to give you a bit of background, the Open Data Institute, where I'm the CEO, is a not-for-profit that works with companies and governments to build an open, trustworthy data ecosystem. We think both of those are important to get the most out of data. Um, so the, the, the questions that were posed for this session were, uh, first how data is being collected and used by AI technologies, and is our data infrastructure fit for purpose? I was particularly pleased to see this question because it had data infrastructure as a phrase in it, something that um, we're very uh, keen on at ODI. Um, the way we define data infrastructure is uh, as consisting of data assets, so the data itself, the organisations that operate and maintain them, and the guides describing how to use and manage that data. Um, if you want to have trustworthy data infrastructure that people can actually use, it needs to be sustainably funded and it needs to be directed to maximise the data's use and value so that it meets society's needs. So we use the analogy of uh, data as being like roads. In the same way as you invest in road infrastructure, you decide where you need to have motorways that are particularly high quality, um, that get people to places faster. You need to invest in data infrastructure in the same way. Um, so we're all still building a data infrastructure that's going to be fit for purpose. And right now, then, there are masses of issues with our data infrastructure. Things like quality, interoperability, accessibility, its reliability, equity of access, and its sustainability. And it's not just government data that is part of our data infrastructure. It's not just public sector data. It's also private sector data. It's also data that comes from civil society. Um, so... Uh, if you're looking at access to data for AI, the more diverse that data is, the less likely you are to have bias, the more you can support innovation, the more you can support new entrants and new services. So we think that opening up that data infrastructure as much as possible, while preserving people's privacy, national security, corporate confidentiality, is the way of getting the most out of that data. Um, the second question was around seeking consent for use of individuals' data. Now, we ought to recognise that data infrastructure is not just about people's data. It's about data about people. It's also, there's a lot of very useful non-personal data that, is, uh, that we need 
um, in order to build AI. But we should be particularly wary about talking about individuals as if individuals' data, as if it belongs to them and as if there's ownership. As Wendy was saying, um, data that is about one person is also about lots of other people, their friends, their family. Um, if it's health records, it's about doc the doctors and nurses that treat them. Um, and it's also about people who are similar to them. So, and when we look at data that's collected by big tech firms, it's collected about people who are not direct users of the services that, um, uh, that, that are collecting data. So you can not be on Facebook, but Facebook can still be collecting data about you. So individual consent is really important, but it's not the only mechanism that we need to look at for getting consent for the use of data. And there are a number of cases um, you know, where we have, as a society, decided democratically that data should be collected and used, whether individuals consent for that or not. Um, the census, for example, or registration of company directors. There are places where public interest trumps individual consent. Um, but there are, there are um, challenges around using our existing approaches to consent. We can never really give fully informed consent about future uses of data that just haven't been anticipated yet. Um, so that individual consent needs to be layered on top of some fundamental regulatory pr protections. And it's also worth, we think, looking at the role of trusted intermediaries who can be de granted some delegated responsibility and also participative approaches like citizen juries in order to suss out public acceptability of use of data. So we need to, in other words, go beyond this idea of individual consent as being the, the uh, be all and end all of, of getting consent for use of data. And then the final question was around um, who should ultimately oversee the use of personal data for AI systems. Um, we see from ODI that lots of organisations, lots of commercial organisations are putting in place internal ethical principles, government as well, um, and practices. And it's great to see data ethics on everybody's lips at the, at the moment. Um, but those, that will mean very little if there isn't some mechanism for accountability when they um, don't meet those principles. So obviously we need one layer of oversight that's going to come from, from regulators, so that includes sector-specific regulators in finance, for example, or telecoms or whatever, as well as the Information Commissioner's Office. It also includes local government um, with devolved powers around transport or accommodation, um, as well as potentially multinational regulators. But we should not forget the role of um, third sector, of consumer groups, trade unions, professional bodies, the media... Um, they're important in other places where we need accountability, um, and where we need consumer protection, where we need citizen empowerment, and they're no less important where data is involved. And both regulators and civil society need to have some transparency about the way in which data is being used, um, so monitoring frameworks, whistleblowers, auditing powers and so on to enable them to do their job. So we would like to see more attention on what do we need to have, what information about the way in which AI is being used for particular decision-making processes um, should be made transparent so that those accountability mechanisms can really come into force. Thank you. Um, really interesting. You talked about transparency and accountability. Um, uh, and... Um, in a sense, the mechanisms that you need in order to make sure that uh, people can be made accountable and it therefore has to be transparent enough. But in a sense, that's slightly circular, isn't it? Because do we have the right mechanisms for audit, for making sure there's ethical design actually currently in play? And um, in your view, are we being, uh, in a sense, energetic enough about uh, uh, actually constructing those? So um, I, I think that, that uh, regulators have some powers that they can exercise around that, but directing those powers and directing resources to places that they should be concerned about is one of the things that is, is problematic. So that's why we kind of su suggest this 
um, that having some transparency around it can help to direct efforts rather than it being a blanket auditing of everybody that uses um, AI decision based systems. But, we, but that transparency means that we may therefore create that focus which then exactly. leads to so, uh, more development. So, uh, so an example, so you know how we have transparency around um, gender equity in pay. That helps us to direct our focus to those organisations that maybe don't have such good practices. What are the similar kinds of transparency mechanisms we can put around the use of AI-based decision-making um, in order to direct our focus and our efforts of accountability into those places we should be worried about? Sorry, just to underline that, but transparency by itself is not enough. Completely, completely agree, but if those accountability mechanisms need it in order to know where to focus their efforts. Great, yeah. thank you. Now, uh, delighted to see uh, Roger Taylor, the chair of the uh, Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, um, uh, which is spelt, spent, spelt uh, not with a uh, C E N T E R, uh, I'm glad to see uh, Nikki uh, on, on, my, on, on my piece of paper here. Um, but uh, Roger um, uh, has already really leapt into the saddle at the uh, Centre for Data Ethics uh, with uh, uh, basically founding, starting two work streams, which I've no doubt you'll be talking about in terms of bias and micro targeting. And it's a very interesting model, in a sense, the, the Centre, in the way that it's advising regulators. Um, and no doubt you'll, in a very sadly brief five minutes, um, tell us everything about it. Yes. So just to, just to give you a bit, bit of an explanation about what the centre is, it's, it has, it's just been set up now. Um, we will be publishing a, a strategy and details of the two projects that we're initially starting on, on bias and, and micro-targeting in March. Um, the, but the, the impetus for it is a view that we want to benefit from these amazing technologies and indeed you might say that we're kind of suffering more harm from our uh, lack of confidence in, in using them for example in healthcare than perhaps we are losing out from, from poor regulation where we, where we are where we are currently. So our, 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 the reason for being created is, is a sense that um, there are some cross-cutting issues that uh, affect the use of AI that affect every area of government and <coughs> uh, 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 operate across society and that these are areas where our current arrangements are not adequate to allow us to safely fully benefit from these technologies and we need to come up with some solutions and has, I, I would fully agree with with the earlier comments about it's all about the control of the data that is really lies at the heart of uh, so many of the ethical issues that arise in this context um, and part of the, the center's remit is to look explicitly at ethical frameworks for data sharing um, the the um, uh, the two initial projects that I say we're going to be looking at, one is looking at, at, at bias, how do you tell whether a, a, an AI system is biased. One of the first things to say about this is we are not, we are, a huge amount of work has been done on high level principles, we're not starting with high level principles, we've had the work of the House of Laws Committee that has informed the creation of the centre. What we're starting to do is look at it sector by sector, specific use, by, use case by use case and understand how do we actually turn these into, into practical uh, uh, governance mechanisms. Our focus is not on making ethical decisions, it's on design, identifying the correct um, uh, governance systems. So in, in, area like, in an area like bias, we can look at, on the one hand, policing, and on the other hand, um, HR, they or indeed uh, social care and health. Now, the, while there's important issues around bias in all of those cases, the specific mechanisms by which they are regulated and managed um, are, will be different in each, in, in each use case. Um, on the question of, sort of you know, where, where are we currently in terms of things, I think there's a, a, a general agreement that, um, that you know, consent mechanisms are not, have not worked as we'd wanted and indeed that there is something, uh, you know, we are not benefiting as much as we'd like to from these, from these uh, uh, technologies because of the uh, concerns about gaps in regulation. I just thought it might be helpful to sort of set out, well, what is it we're looking for? What are the conditions we're, we're actually trying to get to? And the first thing we say, just can, are we confident we can uh, actually adequately regulate these things against existing regulatory standards? That's where a question like bias comes in. There are laws in place right now. The question is simply, can we actually implement those laws in situations where we have huge amounts of data and, and, and algorithms operating very quickly. Then there's the issue of adequate uh, individual control about data, a lot of focus on data portability. That is extremely welcome, but it's worth 
remembering that data portability, it's very hard to make it work in reality. The focus on interoperability to make it actually, you know, the work on open banking has been tremendous, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a beacon in a, in, a, in a landscape where data portability is often undermined by uh, incumbents. Um, but that notion of individual control, I think, is also not wholly adequate because the, the most common uh, issue that arises as people look at these new technologies is for me to have, con have proper control of what's going on, I need to know not just what has happened to me, I need to know how this whole system operates. What is the impact on me? How am I being treated differently from other people as a result of this data being used? Um, I was at a, uh, a research group with a group of 20-somethings who were worried about technology. They were worried about the fact that Facebook seemed to sometimes rob them of their time and they just couldn't, couldn't get free of it or, 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 or gain similarly. They were worrying about financial problems. But very interestingly, they were looking to the technology to help them. They said, well, kind of, can't these things make, make me, help me make better choices? That raises a host of ethical issues. I mean, there's a lot of work going on, some terrific applications that help nudge people one way or another, make better financial decisions, make, uh, 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 avoid the bad decisions. In healthcare, there's a lot of interest in this as well. But that raises a host <coughs> of ethical issues about, you, as an individual, you would need to know before you felt comfortable to subscribe to such a system, well, how does this operate? How do you understand me? What are you doing with my data? <coughs> so we have, we have three layers that we need to think about, one of which is just can we regulate this as we currently do with a diagnostic system in the, in, in the NHS? Can we make sure it's safe? Then there's the question of can we give people more control over this situation? Can we give them greater personal autonomy? And then there's a third, to really give them control, what information would somebody really need to have about the, how the system is operated? Just to end on a very positive note, I think there's a huge amount of extremely constructive work going on in this country. I and mean, I take Wendy's point about, about um, uh, you know, the, 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 the international position and the, and, the, and, the, and the difficulties of navigating that. But I think the work that the ODI is doing on data trusts is, is fantastic. I think the, the consultation that the DWP put out today about pensions dashboards, in which they are recommending personal data control, I can get all my pensions data in one place, but that there will be an independent oversight there that will make sure this actually operates in, 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 on your behalf. Um, the NHS is obviously really focused on trying to make this work, trying to drive up interoperability. And in the private sector, we've had many initiatives in the private sector to try and address data governance, to come up with different models. But I, I, I remain, and, and they've, all, they've always had difficulties, but I remain encouraged. I think the work that, for example, Hackbex has done is, is an exemplary of the, of the sorts of models that, that, that show different types of data governance that may, may point to, to, to different ways of organising things. Um, so I'll... I'll uh, I, 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 I'll stop there, but we, are, we will be reporting late in the year on our first two projects, and a big part of our focus will be on, on data governance and how data governance within specific applications and specific areas can enable more effective use of AI. Great. Thank you, Roger. You mentioned data trust. You mentioned hats. I mean, how much do you feel that you're sort of taking the baton on from Wendy's uh, report and obviously collaborating with ODI and so on, on the data trust agenda? Because, I mean, you talk about personal autonomy. Isn't that a route that actually could be uh, really important in this respect? And also for, you know, governance for public data as well. That's right, and I think and the ODI and, and the Central are working very closely together. I think Wendy has completely, you know, access to data is the issue. It both enables us to use AI, but it also will determine whether, who and how people can tell whether this is operating in a beneficial way and how individuals can access the information that, that they need to know about how they are being treated and whether they approve of it or not. And, and also, to obviously, to, as, as Jenny pointed out, to determine collectively whether, how that conversation should, should occur. So yes, we are working very closely together. I, I, I would say there's a, still a long way to go. You know, they, we, we, they, we've got use cases with uh, relatively uh, um, low privacy concerns that we're starting with. As we move into spaces where we're dealing with more personal data, the line between how much personal control do people have over that, uh, how does the, how, how is that, you know, the, the sheer management of it as an individual, I do not want to spend my, my time managing my data. I want to have somebody yeah. I trust who is, I know is not incentivized to harm me, who is properly accountable, who is looking after me, and making sure that it's being used properly. But how we, how we design those systems is, is we've got some work to do. I mean, your underlying, ag underlying agenda in many respects is that retention of public trust, isn't it? So do you think we're in a bit of a race against time in this respect? I think the... Uh, I think we need to take very seriously this potential for a tech clash, uh, as, it's, as it's put, and it is, it is something we, we need to consider. I all, but I also do have 
confidence that the benefits of these technologies are enormous. And it's worth reflecting that in, in areas where there are issues about the effective governance of data in the, in, in the private sector, while people have been concerned, as it were, consumption of these technologies has not been as, as reduced as it might have been in, a, say, a scandal about uh, another area of consumer products. So, the, the, the benefits of these things speak for themselves. So I, we shouldn't overplay it, but yes, we, it is, it is, what is certainly true is that we will not be able to properly benefit as a society from these technologies unless we get to grips with data governments and can demonstrate that we're doing it in a way the public rightfully trust. Thank you very much. And now to our very own Birgitta Anderson, who is the CEO, amongst many other things, <laughs> of the Big Innovation Centre. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, today I will be speaking with my uh, uh, economics head, I'm an uh, economist, and uh, uh, the things I want to get across here uh, are coming in the relationship to data governance, consent and accountability. Uh, and I want to highlight here, when you look kind of at the law of economics of data, uh, clearly on, on property rights as an economist, you would normally be looking at uh, property rights on land, uh, on, on capital, on labour, uh, and of course also we have the intellectual property rights and now we have data and now we, this whole debate is coming up and from an eco uh, economist perspective so now so I'll first say the two points I want to get across here is that we need a creative commons regarding the way the data is governed and we need user right uh, to data and a social contract on the way they're used and I'll come with evidence here and uh, normally as an economist when you're looking at property rights you're looking at, are you getting the right financial gains and growth you look for? Are you getting the right level of competition you're looking for? Uh, are you getting the innovation you're looking for? Uh, are we building strategic uh, networks uh, which can last? And of course, do we have welfare and well-being? And uh, I think this is where we came when we some years ago decided to talk about the emerging of open source communities. And the issue of data is not so different here. And I'll now give an example. Uh, if, for example, I decide to share my data uh, uh, with Google or with uh, Facebook or with Twitter, uh, it's not because I'm in love with them, but I love their innovations. So when I share with one, I would have absolutely no problem that that raw data goes into a Creative Commons community in which other organizations could use too, so we could all kind of get more innovation and more competition. So that means that there does not need to be only a, a one Facebook, one Twitter, one Google, one uh, Uber, one everything. We could actually create uh, more dynamics and more innovation. And uh, in about 15 years ago, we had something we called a software hearing, where we, that was in the European Union, uh, where we discussed, uh, which I was heavily involved in, where we discussed actually to what extent this software community should be uh, enforced by law. So actually the, the ethics of behaviour in the software community could actually take the court of somebody behaving in their ethics. And I actually think here with, uh, with data commons, we need to think about what are all these kind of benefits which we get. And if we're looking back into the four economics areas I mentioned before, lots of companies today, and we did that at the big innovation centre for, at that time, called the uh, Department of Business Innovation and Skills, uh, we looked at how actually 65% of companies engage in, in software, open source software because they're looking for cost cutting. Uh, we had about 75% uh, because of they want to become more innovative. Uh, we had about uh, 30 to 60 percent because in fact, in fact they could enter more competitive environments and they like the competition and 60 percent because they want to engage strategic relationships and I think actually when, when, if we actually start to create data commons we don't get this kind of one country like China or one big company owning all the data because we talked before also the, the issue of when, when I, even if I give my user rights it's almost there's no difference as we mentioned before between user and ownership rights because anybody can almost do what they want with the data but the value added where the competition comes in is from machine data when they do analytics on my data when they create products, the new business models around my data, better products, I want to buy, I want to swap platform maybe. Uh, this is a, a, a machine data, that's where we can compete, this is a great analytics, but the raw data, I have no problem if it's uh, properly uh, anonymized that, that can be shared in the community to get more innovation and competition, more strategic relationships, better financial gains, and I can get my better products and have increased well-being. 
and uh, we have uh, evidence that that could happen in many uh, other kind of open source and creative commons environments. So that brings me to the last point, to make myself very short here, uh, user rights. Actually, uh, as we mentioned before, there's no way we can manage that data. You know, I'd be up in and up out <coughs> just to get to the thing we want to. Uh, so uh, actually, we might as well just have a basic level in which everybody can access the data. And we did, uh, and, and, did and we did a hackathon with Camden Council and uh, some companies like uh, 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 EDF Energy, uh, Barclays, GSK, and some other companies. This is now some years ago where we looked at actually if Camden Council should have increase uh, their uh, efficiency around repair services and social housing, uh, the ambulance service, and combat street crime, uh, they actually needed access to private data. And we have all this about opening up public data, but not about opening up private data. So what I'm trying to say here is that just as we've had all the public data open set, we need to have these creative commons in which also the public sector and anyone else can access private data to create us uh, uh, this kind of better life. So uh, my two points is uh, a push for uh, creative commons and the need for user rights to data and a social contract on how data is collected and used. Great, Bogita, thank you very much. Um, there's the Furman uh, review uh, taking place, a uh, uh, competition um, in the sort of digital tech area. I mean, if you um, were going to give him a piece of advice uh, and say, this is the one thing that I hope comes out of your report, what would that be? Well, when we did the, uh, uh, when we were preparing our, 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 for Big Innovation Centre, our entry to the political party conferences, we had the theme was the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> and clearly, that was really about uh, 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 artificial intelligence, uh, data capitalism, and tech giants. And it's not like they, you know, it was really just a play with having a kind of fun play. But what we would say to him was really that to understand innovation and competition. Is, the, is something that needs to be taken extremely top level and, uh, and he needs to understand it's when data are shared and there's access and moved towards a creative commons. That's where we actually are going to see some mobility and much more interesting uh, competitive platforms. So that would be my first. And, and you would hope that he would, um, and you imagine that he will be detecting a lack of competition, do you? In, in that whole area of data. Yeah, because we have, we are, we are, we are, this is nothing to do with any company, but we are in that situation that the dynamics of it, the network effects, the increasing return to dynamics does by default create major companies. There's nothing wrong with that, that's how it happens. But it is also, but, but, but one of the things that can create competition in, in my view, is not like when we had uh, 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 at, at the last budget, when Phil Hammond put in a couple of more percentages of tax on, on, tech, on, on platforms of a certain size. That's about really allocating resources. It's not changing the level of competition. If you really want to change the competition, it's about owning the data. That would make a difference. And, there, and this is the way in which uh, uh, he can actually generate more competition innovation. Great. Thank you very much indeed. And um, uh, I was talking about uh, the use of data for uh, transport purposes and so on as being different in kind from health. And lo and behold, we have Lauren Sager uh, Weinstein, from, uh, who is the Chief Data Officer at Transport for London, uh, and can talk to us in uh, greater detail about that. Lauren. Thank you for having me. Um, what I wanted to do is do a bit of a history lesson, because I thought when we think about how do we think about moving ahead and thinking about the world of AI, um, we see this as very much an evolution of an approach and how do we use data to solve some business challenges and societal challenges. And so when we think about going forward, it's helpful to think about where we've been. And we have a long history of using our data and the computer processing power that was available at the time to drive our decision making. So, and in fact, even before our, so the computers, we were doing this analysis by hand, uh, sort of counting people, surveying manually so we can better sort of plan our sort of our transport network uh, back in 1939. And so that heritage of thinking about what we're using the data for, I think it's very important as we are here um, at a crossroads where there is significant change that is happening at pace. Um, and what we have been doing is thinking about how, you know, how do we focus and point our efforts 
um, to, sort of, to address, use data to solve these problems. We've become more sophisticated over time. And when we look to automation, it really is about that link back to solving the underlying challenges um, for planning our network. And this allows us to think about how do we then have the right approach to using depersonalized information where we've taken, uh, removed some personal identification information from the ticketing system so that we can understand customer journey flows to plan our network. And it is a very sort of a, very then a, an evolution to how you do this from a identifying patterns um, and analysis before you even got to sort of machine learning to then think about how you can use sort of the new techniques and use the new computer processing power to sort of speed up this process of calculating and doing analysis much faster. And that's what we've been doing in terms of taking, uh, taking this sort of this heritage, as it were, and thinking about the underlying sort of need <coughs> to provide public services and provide sort of a public transport network for our customers. Now, then you have to say, okay, to answer this sort of other question, which is about how do we think about is our data infrastructure, and the, you know, the data infrastructure question, is it fit for purpose? That allows us to sort of really question how we have collected our, and understood our data and our under, understood our data tools. And this is, a, this is a case about how do we think about the way we're collecting data for what purpose, understanding data quality, um, understanding the different needs for data quality, and then, and you may have different levels of what you need to, to sort of have, but uh, in terms of how pristine your data quality is, but certainly when you're using this data, you must sort of understand how it is sort of being used and what the sort of the faults are and the biases are, because they're going to be sort of underlying uh, sort of errors in, in any, of your, any of your data, and there's, you just have to recognize the sort of how you're collecting, what you're collecting, and what, it's, what questions it can answer and what it can't answer. And, but that does mean that we need to sort of identify what we need to make these data foundations strong. And, we, and that's, that's something that um, my sort of uh, teams of sort of data specialists for many, many years have been sort of a data evangelist for data quality. And what we're finding is that there's even stronger use cases for, for sort of underpinning data quality as we go forward and think about machine learning and think about the sort of the next generation of AI. And so that, that sort of underpins, I think, as, as a uh, sort of entities of using data, we need to be sort of mindful of the importance of this data quality. And then, you know, fundamental is the idea of transparency and, and ethics. And that, you know, it's trust is our license to sort of operate. And we really need to make sure we're clear about how we're using data and the benefits that, we, that we're delivering with it. And so that's where we, um, as a sort of a, a public agency in providing public services, spend a lot of time thinking about making, uh, making it clear to, our, so to the public and to our users and to customers traveling on the network uh, how data is collected, for what purpose, um, and, it, and create this information in a way that can be sort of understood broadly um, by us and our users. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about that and really have a focused effort to make sure that we are, uh, we are sort, of, sort of collecting appropriate data where we have to, but allowing our, our customers not to be known to us um, so that they can, can share data with us in terms of who they are, but they don't have to. Um, and we treat our customers' privacy very, very seriously. And so this is, again, I, I think this is where we need to sort of uh, have sort of conversations about how we as an industry um, and how we as a society having this sort of this dialogue and this discussion about where, where people want to be known and where people don't want to be known and how do we have underpinning this uh, the sort of the infrastructure to support that um, and, and treating when customers do want to be known to us uh, treating this, this privacy extremely seriously and, and where we support them and of course we support our customers through, uh, through our customers, they can ask for a personalized service from us so we'll give them information that's relevant to them. Uh, sometimes we give our customers refunds and again that's a personal connection but we also do a lot of analysis on data that is depersonalized where we're looking at how customers move in aggregate and we want to look at flows of groups of people rather than individuals. And it's that sort of discipline and understanding why fundamentally the, the, what we're collecting and why and how the benefits of data, um, how it can be sort of used for our customers is fundamental.
And that, of course, there's an element of, uh, of sort of, a, as this is changing very rapidly, we need to be sort of on, be constantly sort of thinking about this. And we re are reliant very heavily on uh, the ICO's guidance in terms of how we're doing, how our approach for this. But I think all the other discussions that we're beginning to hear today about how do we think about the, sort of the ethical frameworks, particularly when sort of the industry and technology is changing rapidly, is really helpful. Um, so this is sort of my final point, which is, is that it, we think it's very valuable to have this um, sort of this ethical discussion and this sort of the policy discussion as the industry is changing, so that we can sort of work together to set these sort of guiding policies to protect our citizens and think about this and think about the trade-offs that are involved as a society when we are delivering improvements for the wider community. Thank you very much. It, it's very interesting because, in a sense, we take a lot of the transport data for granted. All of us use uh, the apps that enable us uh, effectively to move around the country, move around the world, move around London. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, in a way, that's become more culturally part of what we do, as opposed to what appears to be more controversial in terms of health data and so on. I mean, if you had any pushback, uh, or did you, I mean, you clearly have quite a, uh, a regard for the sort of ethical framework in which you collect it and so on and share it, but have you ever had any real pushback on, uh, from the public or others on, on the use of transport data? Well, I think it's helpful to divide this data up because we are champions of opening up our data and making it readily available for consumption and use when it's non-personal data. So that is, you know, it's been, um, been a sort of a policy that we've had for many, many years and we have seen the benefits of doing so and we are champions and, and data evangelists in this regard. We think it's very important uh, for just general transparency and general openness, you know, we are providing a public service, um, so our data is public, but it's also helpful for us to make sure that as we're running a sort of a network, um, it's, it's a win-win for sort of our, our, our people to have the information about this, how we're running our services. Um, there is a difference, though, when you look at private data, and that personal data is something that we safeguard, and we do not, um, we do not, we do not release that. Um, we will aggregate it up and present sort of trends and information um, in terms of when you sort of summarize this. But the data itself, when it's personal data, it, we keep it um, very protected. And I think that that's, uh, it, that, that's how we've sort of looked at this. And of course, because the transport network, so much of it is not personal, um, we can offer up a very, very broad, uh, rich sort of set of data um, of public data that we can make available. I mean, there is an interesting question about private data in terms of sort of, uh, sort of how you get some information on people who are not traveling on, the, on our public services but on the, on the private network and how we might get information about uh, people driving, walking, and cycling where we do not collect that data the same way and there's privately held data. But um, it's an interesting debate as well. But certainly on the release side, there's a lot we can release. <coughs> Great, thank you very much indeed, Lauren. And now on to Paul Copping, who I think might bring some of the international um, aspects of data trusts and so on um, to bear, which uh, will bear very nicely on our previous conversation. Paul. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a real honour to be here, and even greater honour to have a chair, having spent the last three meetings sort of hanging off the walls, and um, it's a great <laughs> for everybody else. Um, while I was doing the last three meetings, I was the... Um, Chief Innovation Officer at Digital Greenwich, one of the London boroughs, and was very much involved in the transport aspects and, and other aspects of public um, innovation, if you like. And, and so a lot of common overlaps with, with, with the TfL uh, perspective. Um, the reason this transition happens to being here representing Sightline Innovation, which is a Canadian AI company currently in Toronto and hopefully very soon with my help arriving in, in Europe, is that I was uh, a member of... Uh, a series of workshops organised by the uh, Technology Entrepreneurship Centre at Harvard University in, in Dublin, then Toronto, and then most recently in Las Vegas. And, and the Toronto one unearthed a site on innovation who've been doing a load of work on data trusts uh, for the last many years, having previously sold another business to BlackBerry, and there being some tie-up with that sort of Canadian gentry of, uh, of the uh, various revolutions. And um, uh, what I found was a, uh, an approach to data trusts, which is way ahead of anything I've found in, in Europe. So at the end of the advertorial, and just to say, well, how do we currently collect data? And um, uh, since I first drafted this, I've been 
clicking, clicking on acceptance of cookie notices uh, <laughs> even more consciously. The more you think about it, the more you think, I really ought to stop and read this, but I haven't actually got time at the moment, even though I'm going to be speaking about it on Monday. And um, I clicked on two or three over the weekend when I was in Germany trying to find something. I thought, I really ought to look at that, but there's just no time. And I think that affects all of us, that, that it's an extremely rare for any of us to, to check the privacy policies of the acceptances that, that we give. So GDPR is, is, is observed in, in form, but, but not, in, not in function uh, uh, currently. Um, one of the other very rare things is for people to actually invoke the rights of GDPR, particularly Article 17, the, 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 uh, the right to be forgotten. Um, and it's a bit geeky to do that, I believe. I'd be interested if anyone, by wave of a hand, has actually invoked Article 17 with anybody at all. Anyone done it? Article 17? No. Um, so, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, it's behind me. Right. <laughs> uh, so, um, there is, I think, a possibility that, that this way that we give data, what is currently happening is that we're giving away rights to, to data ownership uh, in a woody nilly way. And there are people thinking about this industrially, and I think there's a possibility that GDPR could be effectively weaponized in order to create a different model that is actually uh, more secure. And the fundamentals of a data trust are that instead of giving data directly to, to an organization, you give it to a trustee who you, you, you appoint, and the trustee manages your data for you against a series of policies which you negotiate with the trustee, and then dishes out a view of your data, not a copy, a view of your data, to the data users uh, on terms that you agree. In the particular case that I'm looking at with, with Sightline International, they've already embedded a, a distributed ledger technology micropayment thread alongside the artificial intelligence for, for future use, because there is value flowing around here, and it hasn't yet created uh, an industrial structure. So um, when we think how these things might change, um, I, first of all, uh, I mentioned before Wendy arrived uh, that excellent paper which I was blown away by, which, was, which she's just summarised, so I don't need to. Um, but that whole thing about what type of industry and what type of internet we want to create is, is critical because it actually decides which way you stack the deck uh, in terms of is it, is it this, what she calls the bourgeois Brussels model where we, we actually protect the identity. By the way, I, I was involved in, in Etsy as a chairman of, a, of an in, industry specification group last year and um, I spoke at one of their security conferences. And it's hard to keep in mind that there was 10 years of political negotiations to get to GDPR. And a big part of it is that some of the delegates involved in that were in countries where they weren't totally seeing ITI with their national governments. And the, the strengths and protections in GDPR partly reflect a sort of bulletproofing of the rights of the individual. And, um, and it can be sort of treated as something purely commercial, but there is something more intrinsic in the way that Europe dragged its way to the GDPR stuff over a very long period. Now we're in that situation where it isn't currently being put into use. Data trusts create a way in which people can pass over their rights to manage their own data and take this very current example that's been all over the papers this weekend of the death of Molly Russell. Uh, had Molly Russell had a data trustee, I'm not suggesting she could have done it under those circumstances, but say hypothetically somebody contemplating suicide was in the service of a data trustee, those policies could be designed in such a way that they would detect transition patterns and transaction patterns sorry, which, which, were, which were not healthy and policies could be put in place to adjust the flow of data uh, in any of the ways that have been decided. We're now talking about, as Matt Hancock was on the telly yesterday saying, saying, you know, we can make rapid legislation if we don't get good collaboration with the major players in social media. But we don't actually have a traction point in, in the legislation to say who actually executes the, the legislation. Um, the, the structure of going towards a data trustee and a data trust uh, model allows the possibility of um, individuals being protected. And uh, as uh, Jenny said, I mean, there are occasions when uh, public duty of care will trump the right to consent and, and possibly the right to privacy. Um, and those are the fundamental things that, that, that have to be sorted out. At what point do we say, trump card, we don't want you to kill yourself, we're going to intrude into your life? Or indeed, uh, inland homelessness or drug abuse or any of these, and all of these things are being actively explored at the moment by a number of AI players. Uh, and on a, on a less dramatic scale, the, the current call under the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund for Healthy Aging 
is getting a lot of attention. It's being delayed at the moment, but there's 98 million quid of, of grant funding coming out sometime in the next quarter or two, um, which will create a lot of activity in the area of, of nudge, behaviour nudging in order to get people off the trajectories of life that will lead to huge health costs. And that's completely in line with NHS's digital relaunch and is the sort of area where people can volunteer for their data to be uh, used on a personal level. And this is personal data, it's not anonymised. Um, and one of the interesting things about the recent workshop I was at in Las Vegas is that all the American delegates there, there were about 15 American cities, were talking in terms of how to, how to avoid personal data by anonymising and slicing, um, on the assumption that people couldn't be identified because it was sort of the law and some states are beginning to adopt GDPR-like regulation. In fact, as we, as we said in this meeting earlier, there are a number of popu population segments very willing to share their personal data and would want that data to be used personally. There's a, a policy issue here that if we design the industry to slice out individualised data and anonymise it all, we're going to lose the thread of the ability to produce the return, <coughs> the return line into individual outcomes. So we need to think very hard as to which things need to be individual and which things need to be anonymised uh, and, and aggregated um, on a very sort of, you know, localised level. I, I was working with Greenwich's uh, automated pod services. I mean, if you, if you have demand for an automated pod, you do actually need to know who wants it and sometimes what their circumstances are and if they're disabled and so on. And that, that, that AI model gets very personal. Um, and I think we should encourage the industry to go that way in terms of very specific personal service models and for people to disclose their needs and, and their circumstances in detail. Um, I think I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it just, I mean, I, I certainly uh, think you've certainly expanded the, the concept of the data trust um, in the minds of many of us uh, around uh, the table and in the room. Um, uh, you know, what I thought was very interesting, because I'd never seen a data trust in, in the sense in which you're saying that a trustee, in a sense, uh, has, an, has oversight of a duty of care, which, I mean, I think is, is you know, it's quite a novel concept. It may not be novel um, uh, in, uh, internationally, but it's certainly, I think it's novel in, in UK domestic terms. What's the, the forum for debate on that kind of thing? Are we talking about looking at GDPR again in terms of the data trust concept or should we be looking at this in terms of the online safety strategy? Where's the, where's the uh, well, forum for talking about that kind of uh, construction, so to speak? Well, first thing say, I don't think it's novel. I think the, the, the novelty is in the, the, the terms of the policy which the trustee can be given. So we've already established that a trustee can operate to policies agreed with the user. GDPR allows the user to ask everyone else to, to forget, or at least some people to, to forget us, and then to give our, our data with conditions to, to the trustee. So GDPR is fine. We've, no, we've got no issue with, with any of the GDPR mechanisms. What then gets interesting is if you then actually enforce GDPR, um, by issuing um, uh, a forget me notice to possibly a thousand different organisations. That hasn't so far happened, but I think it's probably imminent. And uh, in those circumstances, the, the free ride of, of, of mass uh, contextual advertising would, would be curtailed considerably, and the balance of power in the flow of that information would, would be skewed, not completely, but partly, back towards the consent patterns of the individual and the way that the individual wanted uh, uh, data to be used. So, so I think um, there is no fundamental need for change in legislation in any of the, the uh, blocks we've talked about. GDPR isn't currently up and running, really. I mean, it is. Uh, I mean, the mere fact that nobody's actually issuing uh, forget me notes is... Uh, 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 is Wow. An indication, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Um, and there is a commercial angle there which some bright people are thinking about. And I think it could be very beneficial to, uh, to light a fuse on the EPR and make it a much more aggressively implemented regime.
you. Um, yeah, I'm going to come back and I'm going to um, throw the uh, uh, things open. There will be plenty of um, time to come back on that. I, I, could, I could see that there wasn't total harmony on this side. No, of the oh, there was. Oh, very good. Okay. They don't like harmony around here, you know. Um, <laughs> Lord Willis. Yeah, well, a fascinating presentation. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I like the fact that we're trying to be realistic, not purist, because data is not simply and solely exclusively someone's personal property. And we wouldn't have made a lot of our advances in understanding medical conditions if, you could, if, if it was a secret that you've got cold. <coughs> um, but what you've just said follows on from something that Brigitte said that I wanted to understand better. You said we should be able to share data properly anonymized. And a lot of the power of machine learning and AI comes precisely from linking different data sets. And you have to have unique identifiers in order to extract the value from linking these different data sets. So I would be very interested to hear from the experts today exactly what properly anonymized means if you are trying to connect different data in order to drive the digital revolution. Great, thank you. And now I'm going to ask our parliamentary, any um, additional? No? Right, um, so we'll crack on with that and I think we'll give everybody a, a, a piece of the action here and then we'll throw uh, the questioning out to the room. Uh, who'd like to kick off with that? Roger, do you feel moved? Yes, I do, because I think that's, that is exactly the question. I think what Paul was saying um, highlighted these, these, these two mechanisms. There is this notion of, of just stripping it out of the actual data itself, but as you rightly point out, stripping identifiers, A, that kind of undermines its usefulness, and there's also the question that even if you take off identifiers, you still, in many circumstances, have a record that is individual and therefore, in theory, might be linked back to the individual. So there's, the, while anonymization, you know, and to be fair, anonymization in its proper sense doesn't just mean about the data, it means about the data and the entire governments around it. Mm. So, that, so that this mechanism is, is potentially can address <coughs> the issues that you're talking about. But I think one of the reasons why there's a lot of interest in the sort of mechanisms that Paul is talking about with data trustees who are managing data on your behalf is that one mechanism they can do is they can hold your personal data, but they can allow individuals on the correct term to access your data and only access those elements of the data that they require for the specific task they are, they are doing. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of an approach that could achieve much of what is attempted to be achieved through anonymization, but if you can get enough data into one, 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 one set, you can have a potentially slightly more uh, granular control over how that data is used, which can reassure some of the some concerns that people, people may have. Wendy. Echo that. I don't think you can properly anonymise. Uh, if you do linking, once you do linking, you can't. That, that reveals always. I think. Um, I think I, I would like to explore more. And I'm not an expert in this, but the idea, the privacy preserving technologies that are coming out. I think are a different way to handle this than trying to anonymise the data. I mean, obviously. You should seek to anonymise as much as you can, but in the knowledge that that does not give privacy. And I think privacy preserving technologies like the company Privatar are doing. Uh, Privatar is one to watch. Uh, there are others, no doubt. But and you, is that include use of blockchain and those sorts of things? Oh, it's independent. Uh, it's it's independent. <laughs> you could uh, blockchain. <laughs> blockchain is just an architecture. <laughs> 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 Right, well, we're, <laughs> I don't chair the blockchain all party, I'm about to say. We'll have you as a guest there, I'm sure, but you will make sure of that. Jenny, did you yeah, want to add to that? Yes, I, yeah, I do. So, um, I completely agree. In order to get real value out of data that is about people, about individuals, then you need to have individual information about them. You basically, um, you, you cannot anonymise any kind of data that is where the the rows, if you like, each record is about a person. That just doesn't happen. Um, so you have to find the governance mechanisms that we put around access to that data and the accountability mechanisms that we put around access to that data that give us the guarantees and assurances and build trust in the way in which that data is used. Um, so data trusts are, are, are one form, and, and this has been mentioned, we're, we're doing some work at ODI around them. Um, I should point out that there, there are, well, 
there, there were 18 kinds of definitions when we start, started looking at data trusts. It's one of those terms that you can kind of, um, everybody sees what they want to see. How do you like Paul's model? Um, so the, the model that Paul was describing is, is um, how, what we would describe that as is a bottom-up data trust. So that's one where individuals say, um, putting data into that data trust and then other organisations can access it. The ones that we're mostly um, investigating at the moment at ODI are ones where organisations have a whole set of data and it's about um, putting the right kind of structure in place to enable the organisation to share all of that data or some of that data with other organisations. But it still has that essential quality of having some kind of um, some kind of trustee who is charged with looking after the interests of the data providers, the individuals that might be mentioned within that data, the data users who might want to do all sorts of innovation over the top of it, and any third parties who might be affected by um, the way in which that data is used. So as an example, we're doing um, one in a kind of city context where it's about um, city data. And of course, the, the provider might, is uh, the organisation that's got all these nice IoT things in lampposts. The users might be all sorts of startups and SMEs that are using that in order to create really, or, or researchers that are using that to do things that are really good. But the third parties that we also need to worry about are the citizens within that city and the way in which that data collection might affect them. So what you need in place then for that data trust is, is it needs to have the right, the, the, those trustees who are really given, that, um, given that, that remit and authority to look after the interests of all those people. Um, you need the right kind of legal structure in place, which is how we understand it, a, a, a data trust is like taking some of those legal trust mechanisms into, uh, into uh, data. You also need the right kind of transparency around decision making, around who gets access to that data. You need the right kind of engagement with users and other stakeholders. So it's kind of a data trust is, is a, um, has a number of components that the, the, the description Paul gave is, is one particular form. We're looking at some other particular forms in three pilots that we're doing at the moment. But those are the kinds of governance mechanisms that you need to have in place in order to get the unlock that value from data that otherwise the, the technology um, can't... Uh, it, uh, pseudonymization, doing uh, homomorphic encryption, synthetic data, all those kinds of things you, you, can, you can apply, but it's the governance that really unlocks that value. Okay, I'm going to bring in uh, 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 Lady Kramer in a second, but I'm just going to see, Bogici, did you want to come in? Just, or Lauren or Paul? Just a very, very, very small thing I want to add. Uh, uh, when we did uh, the hackathon uh, with Camden Council, and we also worked with the Digital Catapult at that time, and we developed what we call a trusted data accelerator. Uh, and uh, this is really about how to do business to business data sharing or uh, also involving personal data and uh, government data. And what that, what this is, and, and what that <coughs> concluded was really that uh, you can share, to, you know, the way to deal with this is you can only share data for that purpose. So if it is about repair services or social housing to avoid fire or other things, you can share data for that purpose, but not the irrelevant data around, <coughs> but all the, at that time, irrelevant data then might be relevant to share for the uh, make more effective ambulance service or combat street crime. So this kind of purposeful data sharing where everything else has to be falling out. And then we also looked at how you could mess data, how different organizations can a, a mess data without actually sharing the data because you can online do online data <coughs> analytics together without anybody actually, uh, uh, you know, the no data is moving, so there's no data stored. <coughs> the solutions are uh, just, just the machine data is stored. So again, uh, uh, it's all about being very purposeful and not always sharing the data. Okay. Did you want to add anything? Well, it, it just, just uh, I guess, worth commenting that I was talking about the folks bottom up model because we're mainly focused on citizen data today. But uh, in fact, my route into this bizarrely was through being at Greenwich and doing the the, uh, the sharing cities project that Jen is talking about, which was which was the uh, which is the the, the lamp post that are currently um, uh, fleeing through to the GLA and back into the ABI. So it's a very small very small AR world. And um, <laughs> actually, this role yeah, actually, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I think I'd just, just say that the, the enterprise architecture, and particularly the ability to run uh, a multi-tenant uh, IPR enterprise server, so in other words, be able to run segregated IPR all the way through multiple organizations, 
was actually the thing that got me on my feet and moving towards cycling in the first place, and is where the, the big bucks are. But in order to build a citizen-centric system, which is the, the sort of mantra of the, the last four years I've been doing sites, uh, um, smart city architectures, a citizen-centric system uh, only begins to make sense economically if you can actually find an endpoint for the, for the value chain. And, and the data trustee is potentially that endpoint. And that has sim um, significant implications for um, the NHS business model for financial services, for retail, for public transport, and for most other things that you can point it at. And going back to an earlier conversation about the silo approach to this, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges about this discussion we're having is it won't sit silo by silo. I'm delighted to say it's a totally horizontal issue. Um, and you, you have to try to, to weave across all the domains of relevance, because that's where the business model is. Uh, and, and that's a challenge yeah. for some of our panel uh, yeah. in their yeah. daytime incarnations, actually. Yeah. Um, Lauren, was there anything? I, mean, I just wanted to sort of reflect on the fact that what's going to be the challenge here is how do you get that alignment on which use cases are the ones that actually you say, yes, we as a society think that this is uh, either you get enough bottom up input from people saying, I'm willing to share on this use case, this use yeah. case, and this use case, um, or are there the ones that you say the public good? Um, sort of over overrules this, and we are going to put in provisions to share. Uh, I still think that we're we need to do some some deep thinking, and ethical thinking about about how you draw those lines and how do you structure the decision making from a policy point of view to sort of set up your framework to sort of have these conversations. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take a, a, a question from Lady Kramer, and then um, I'm going to uh, take two from the audience, and then. Hopefully, our panel will have time before we close to answer uh, in their customary fashion. So no, I just wanted to press a little on this. I'm sorry to be a terrible cynic. I did spend my life in financial services and politics. But, uh, but I'll give you an example, and maybe this will make my question clearer. So I work a great deal with whistleblowers. And all of the um, regulations for whistleblowers, the appropriate corporate governance, the identifier of you know, whistleblowing champions in every organisation, whatever else, it's all there, absolutely all there, and pretty much none of it works. There's, uh, and for a simple reason, you know, it, uh, um, there's, uh, whistleblowers are a deep challenge to the system. I look at something like at data, and data to some people is power, and to other people is money. And those two motives are so powerful in undermining most regulatory and protection systems that are put in place. I, I just don't understand how we create the right environment of trust, even with the kind of mechanisms that you've described. And I just wanted to sort of place that challenge in front of you, because the terrible thing with, that, with data is once it's gone, or it's in somebody else's hands, it's gone. You can't get your data back. You know, it's not like the television that was stolen gets handed back to you. It's now gone. The, so, and, and I just don't know how we, how we manage a situation that has so many threats in it that, uh, as those that I can see. A rousing response to the challenge will be the final um, end of the, um, of the session. So one there and one there. Clay Whitby, technology ethicist. Um, and until Paul threw data trustees into the mix, we were in serious danger of making the traditional error of the entire IT profession in assuming that everybody was like us. Um, and it's very important, I think, to realise that a lot of data subjects are not like people in this room. They're not mentally competent adults. What about children? What about old people with cognitive impairment? So any talk of regulation, any talk of a centre for data ethics has got to have a policy on the very vulnerable, and we haven't discussed that. So I really think it's important that everybody in the room hears that not everybody's like us. You have to protect the vulnerable too. Great, thank you. And I should have asked everybody just to say who they were. Could you just, um, so that everybody knows um, where you're coming from, so to speak? Yeah. I'm a technology ethicist. <laughs> Great. Ben Walsh, Future Studies, Kath Holt. Um, it actually follows on from the same point. I wonder if our public bodies have the right duties they need for this data environment. 
Generally, public bodies have duties to protect data. They do not have duties positively to use data. <coughs> public bodies don't spend the resources on things that aren't in their objectives and their remit. So I wonder if we need, we actually, we're talking about this being very complicated and someone needs to stand up to public. Well, actually, in a lot of cases, that's going to be public bodies. And, and well, you know, what I work on, uh, smart cities, it's local public bodies. And, you know, they, they have a lot to do the day job. And I think mean, it's very difficult for city councils to put resources into developing this kind of capability at the moment. But, you know, while we put uh, duties on companies not to unfairly discriminate, against certain groups of people. It's really only the public sector that we put the, the duty on positively to ensure that even people who do not take part in the discussions still gain from the benefits. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I think those have been very linked uh, questions, actually, um, starting with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Lady Cramer's question. Who'd like to sort of kick off with that? Roger, are you, are you sort of fully yes. immersed in... <laughs> All those aspects, right? I, 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 would, I would not be so pessimistic. Um, I totally agree with your analysis that data is power and data is money. We are currently at a point where that power or money is very heavily concentrated. And what I think everybody on this panel is talking about is how do we find mechanisms that share that power more equitably and put in place circumstances that can, can provide assurance to, that it is being used in people's behalf, even if they don't take steps themselves to pr protect themselves. Um, I just wanted to make a, a couple, couple of final comments as well on the, on the general earlier discussion. <coughs> I th first thing to say is I think these, these, these top-down and bottom-up models, they are not um, exclusive. Yes. So the, the sorts of privacy-protecting technologies we're talking about can allow a situation in which your health data is held under a trust. That trust has duties to protect children and it will stop certain things happening to them. It has duties to protect citizens. and <coughs> That would include, for example, Duties such as communicable diseases, where you're simply not allowed under current, you know, it doesn't matter where the data is held, you're simply not allowed to keep that secret if it becomes known. It has to be communicated because there's, there's a public risk. So it would administer public risk, but also manage on behalf of the individual where they wish to say, I do not want data used for this kind of um, uh, purpose, this kind of <coughs> but I'm quite happy to have it used here. So they're not exclusive. The final point to say is you, you asked originally about the point of traction, because, and this is, I think is one of the biggest questions, which is how do we get get this thing going. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, while I agree these are issues that, that cut across all sectors, I do feel kind of like one of the main areas where certainly policy can drive forward is thinking about how is public <coughs> data used. And I think that is where we're getting to. So if you look at the work that's being proposed with pensions data, the proposal is that each individual can take their pensions data, it must be held through a third party, it, there will be a third party that will oversee how this, the, what their functions will be, but they could have a minimal function of simply making sure everyone follows the rules and gives you the data and that you don't go and give it to a charter but give it to a regulated organisation, or they could do more than that, they could have a, have, have a more protective function. That's for society to decide. But these models that we're talking about, I think they are, we are, we're on the cusp, we're getting very close to sort of identifying the use cases and I think government has a, has a significant role to do in encouraging that. I think it will be individual use cases initially, but with, with a mind to thinking we've got to have an approach to this that will work across the, across the whole spectrum. Uh, Wendy, uh, <coughs> clearly Paul has read your paper with extreme care, um, especially uh, he likes the title, I think is it the Brussels Bourgeois yes. model. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We have a lot title for all of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I just want to sort of, this is uh, my last chance to say anything, right? So I'm just going to start including all the yes, questions, yeah, absolutely. right? So I wanted to say that I'm not as sceptical as Lady Crimm. I think you're very right to raise that. I, I believe, I'm very excited that when we put the idea of data trust in our report, we knew that was the most important issue we had to tackle. All the others are really important, but we just knew. That was why it's the number one recommendation. I'm really excited that it's being picked up in the way it's being picked up. The best blog on data trust is on the ODI's website by Jack, yeah? Yeah, Jack, Jack Harding's. Harding's blog. Um, as, as Jenny said, data trust can be interpreted in many different ways. People in trust can put all sorts of interpretations on the point of what they think. And, and, and read Jack, Jack's blog if you want the idea of all the different models for a data trust. I love the way it's emerging is this idea of data trustees and trustee boards that can protect the vulnerable and the weak um, in the way that you do with finances for people. And it's the same, same sort of analogy 
We have to, I think, throw technology at the issue of um, this in terms of how we protect people and, and you know, correct, protect their privacy, uh, because anonymisation is not... We have, pe we have to share our data for all sorts of reasons, like the health one. If we want to build smart cities of any sort, mm. you've got to share. You've done, how can anyone build a smart city if they don't know what you want to do? Right? It's not going to be smart. And, and you will want to do different... You'll, you'll be a different person in different contexts. Um, and you'll need a data trust for a block of flats. Because people in that block of flats are going to have to decide how they want that block of flats to respond to their request for more water, less water, more, you know, all the... You, know, you can't build a smart city without tackling this problem. Absolutely crucial. So if the UK can get this right, um, and you asked, um, somebody asked, you asked, I think, um, Tim, about where does this discussion happen? Well, we've got the ODI piloting for us, and I think CDI was... This is, this is where this discussion, this is what CDI is yeah. built, is created to do. <laughs> well, there you have it. No pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is the Great. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Jenny? Um, so, just to pick up on, on some of the questions, I, th I think it is really encouraging also to, to hear from the uh, rest of the people on the, on the panel here, um, this real recognition that ethical use of data is also about having access and using it for public benefit. It's not just about personal protection benefit. and personal yeah. benefit. Too, yes. um, I take, uh, I um, complete, uh, and also the, the common thing about recognising that um, we need mechanisms beyond individual consent, and that includes delegated responsibility, I think, for people who are more vulnerable. And how, how we set that up in a framework that, that really works, I think, is the challenge that we are all facing. We don't know how to do this because we're just starting doing it. But there are existing models in other domains that we can use from, we can, we, we can learn from, we can try and replicate, but also we need to recognise data is different. It has different kinds of properties. And so just copying and pasting kind of models from somewhere else in, into our, our data world is, is, uh, is not the thing that we need to do. Um, I think that there are some, some real risks, uh, uh, to your point, Lady Kramer. Um, the, and I think that we do need to tread carefully in some areas, but we have to also recognise that there are a range of different kinds of areas where we're using AI, and some of them are more sensitive than others, and that we need to have a proportionate response. We, we can't just say um, we need all of the levels of governance that there can possibly be on, uh, you know, spell correction on my phone, right? That, that isn't what we, that's not what we need. We need proportionate response for in different kinds of challenges. Um, but we do need to tread carefully in those places where there are challenges that, that, we, that we think are going to severely impact people, impact society, impact our communities. And that's where I go back to my point around monitoring. We need to... The, the world is changing very rapidly and our technological capability is changing rapidly. Our ability to experiment with different kinds of governance models is, is changing rapidly. We need mechanisms in place to just keep an eye on what is happening. This is something I'd like the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation to do. Make <laughs> <laughs> uh, your pitch now. <laughs> yeah. If we're all just yeah. putting Great. some people. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm afraid it's a minute each, uh, but Lauren, Paul, and then Bogita. Um, so I think it's clear that we know there'll be a lot of individual AI uh, sort of happening and in a siloed format. So I think what's what's evident from our discussion today is the question here is how how do we think about transparency and governance on that? And then if you think about the real win here of uh, how do you make a make a policy case for combining uh, combining things together to sort of solve some of the bigger challenges? Uh, I still think there's a this is this is such a, a, a challenge to do this um, that I think there's a lot of complications that will have to have to come through in terms of just the regulatory and the sharing and the privacy protection, but also practicalities of just getting different data sets to talk to each other and to line up. Um, and I, so it's going to be exciting um, when you have a, a strong use case to do it, but it's going to be hard work to get this all done. Uh, so I think that the question comes is, do we sort of pick some of these things that are actually easy wins to start with, where there it's not as sensitive in terms of some of the data that we'd be combining and sharing, demonstrate the value and what you can win with, 
Um, do we pick, or do we pick some of the biggest problems that we want to tackle, and then just say we're going to slog through the difficulties and um, and just sort of really tackle it because it's important? And I think those are some of the key questions we need to think about um, in terms of how we want to solve some of these challenges. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I think um, taking Lady Kramer's point about the effectiveness and the potential of, of cultural change in these areas and whether means are effective. I just say, and also linking to this issue about vulnerable people, um, if any of you have worked in the third sector or any voluntary stuff, I'm a church leader, and if you've done the brownies or whatever else, then you, you know an awful lot more about the disclosure and barring service than you ever wanted to hear about, uh, because you will have been on four or five courses if you're actually leading anything. Um, the, the protection of individuals, uh, whether they're young or, or vulnerable in other ways, uh, is changing very rapidly in the way that we we deal with people. I think we just need to nudge over into the data world and make similar provisions for the protection of the data life of children like Monty Russell, as I, as I, I mentioned earlier. Um, the same applies also to at the other end of the spectrum um, with the um, power of attorney and the, and the duties of, of uh, uh, the state to regulate who might speak on behalf of people who are cognitively impaired. And at the moment, that's bro broken up broadly into a commercial uh, and, and sort of business life, if you like, and then a separate health and well-being section. And I think it might be worth thinking about a data element of that and saying, is there, is there a point at which um, somebody is not actually fit to operate their own data uh, regime, but may actually be not just offered the opportunity of a trustee, but required to operate through a trustee because they are otherwise at, at risk of exploitation? <coughs> Very interesting. Thank you. Bagita, at the clock strike seven. Um. So I've got five seconds here. Okay. So uh, I really think that the, so the point I just want to put across is to say something quite different uh, uh, from uh, some of the other comments here summing up. Uh, I really think that uh, one thing is very important, <laughs> this is it's not just the ethical <laughs> question of uh, how your data is used, but it's also the ethical question of whether you can deny to share your data. And that's where my user rights comes in. Because if you want to live in a smart uh, city, smart bloggers, flats, and get uh, smart health, smart transport, uh, aren't you also a citizen to you obliged to share your data? And I think you are. Uh, so I think that, uh, of course, we need things to share things ethically, but also I think also that you, you cannot just refuse to share your data under many circumstances, well, under most circumstances. Uh, unless, of course, that something extraordinary is required for your data. So uh, I will push through uh, the user rights and I will push through uh, the uh, notion of Creative Commons. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Well, it's been a fascinating uh, session, I must say. I hope you agree. We've really unpacked some really interesting aspects. Um, great. Thank you very much to our panel. Thank you.